All right, thanks for coming, folks. Um, really pleased to be here. Um, so I'm going to give you a, a whistle-stop tour of a lot of the themes and stories that are in the book. Um, and this will go on for about half an hour, and then we can have some questions later. Okay, so I'm going to start by taking you back in time <clears throat> to 1675, so 350 years ago, and to Delft, a town in the Netherlands, where a man named Anthony van Leeuwenhoek is about to change the world. Uh, this man is not a scholar, he has no scientific training at all, but he does have two qualities that are incredibly important. He has an insatiable curiosity about the world around him, and he has the world's most powerful microscopes. He makes them himself. He grinds these impossibly perfect spherical lenses, um, and he sandwiches them between two brass plates to create this object that looks a little bit like a glorified door hinge, but it does, in fact, magnify objects ten times better than anything else that exists at the time. And Leeuwenhoek turns them onto everything he can find at the time, onto bits of animals, onto bits of plants, onto water that he that has collected in an urn outside his house, into water from canals and lakes in Delft. And everywhere he looks, he sees tiny little organisms, microscopic creatures that until then no one knew existed. He was the first person in all of history to see um, to, to see bacteria with his own eyes and to know that they exist. And that must have been a truly momentous point of time um, in, in science, in uh, the history of the world, to know that these creatures that are everywhere were actually around. He realizes that there are more organisms living in a drop of water or in the dental plaque that collects in his teeth than there are people in the entirety of the Netherlands. Now, was he disgusted by this? Was he revolted by it? Actually, no. He was really excited to learn that his body was full of all these other living things. The idea that microbes are synonymous with disease and dirt is actually a more recent one. Um, it came a few centuries after Leeuwenhoek when scientists discovered in very quick succession that many of the most infamous plagues of humanity, things like actual plague, Leprosy, gonorrhea, syphilis, cholera, tuberculosis, all of these diseases were caused by bacteria. And so they forever became known as germs. They became cast as villains, as antagonists that we needed to destroy, lest they destroy us first. Well, this point of view is deeply wrong. It's unfair because only a few hundred kinds of microbes are known to cause disease. The vast majority are either benign or beneficial to us. And in fact, they are the lords of the planet. They have been around for much longer than we have, and they run the show. So if we consider the length of this desk to be representative of the entire history of the planet, so that Earth was created here, and that we are now here, then humans evolved here. Uh, the dinosaurs ruled around here. Uh, all the multicellular life that you know, all the animals and plants and so on, evolved around here. And microbes, the first living things, bacteria, evolved here. So for the vast majority of life on Earth, it was entirely microscopic. You would not have been able to see it with your naked eyes, which would have been fine because eyes only evolved here. <laughs> OK, so we are all just the icing on this grand microbial cake. Um, animals evolved in a world that was already full of and dominated by microbes, and we came to live with them, we evolved to exploit them, and we evolved to crucially depend upon them. Uh, every human today, uh, all of us, contain around 39 trillion microbial cells in our bodies, roughly one for each of our actual human cells. So we are all merely half the people we think we are. Um, this is a sponge among the simplest of animals. It's just a couple of cell layers sandwiching a bit of jelly. But it, too, is home to a thriving microbiome, a community of bacteria and other microbes. Every ant, even though it lives in a colony of millions, is in fact a colony in itself. A polar bear that walks solo through the Arctic tundra is in fact completely surrounded. 
bar-headed geese fly microbes to the top of the Himalayas. Sperm whales dive them down into the deepest oceans. And when these people set foot on the moon, they were also taking a giant step for microbe kind. <laughs> these little organisms are not just stowaways. They're not just hitchhikers in our bodies. They also confer incredible abilities to their hosts. This adorable creature is the Hawaiian bobtail squid. It could fit in the palm of my hand. It has glowing bacteria in its undersides that shine light below the squid, and that light perfectly matches the moonlight welling down on top of the animal, so that any predator looking at the squid from below cannot make out its silhouette. This squid has an invisibility cloak created by bacterial light. More sinisterly, these little white worms kill insects by vomiting toxic bacteria into their bodies. This bird, the hoopo, paints its eggs in antibiotic-producing bacteria that stop the chicks within the eggs from catching disease. The spotted hyena writes an autobiography in bacterial pastes. It has microbes in scent glands in its backside those, uh, pr that produce odors that match the hyena's sex, age, species, and social status. And this long worm called paracatenula, a flatworm, can regenerate almost its entire body as long as it has some of those dark colored microbes within it. Humans too rely on our microbiome for all sorts of things. They help us to digest our food. They help to build and shape our organs. They help to train and calibrate our immune systems. They may even help to ch uh, affect our behavior. So I've been writing about this topic for about 10 years, and there are a few areas of biology that fascinate me more, because it totally subverts our understanding of the life around us. I have been fascinated by natural history since I was a kid. Um, I went to zoos a lot. <laughs> this is a picture of me with a kid on my back. Um, and I watched David Attenborough documentaries, and I read wildlife books. And I came to realize through writing this book and through re reporting on this topic that when I go to a zoo, every visitor and resident there is a zoo in their own right. When I look at the world around me, at all the animals and plants I see, all of that is profoundly influenced by things I cannot see. And that without knowing them, without understanding the microbes around us, we cannot really understand ourselves. And indeed, without, when we look at the microbial world, very familiar and everyday parts of our lives take on this unfamiliar and newly wondrous uh, quality. So for example, breastfeeding seems like a way of nourishing a baby, and it is, but not entirely so, because some 10% of breast milk consists of these sugars called human milk oligosaccharides, or just HMOs, which babies cannot digest. Those sugars are there to nourish microbes in the baby's gut, and particularly strains like that one at the bottom, B. infantis, which has evolved to specifically digest those sugars with incredible efficiency. And when it does that, it nourishes the baby's gut cells, it seals up the lining of the gut, and it reduces inflammation. So a breastfeeding mother is not just nourishing infants, but infantis too. She is building an entire world inside her baby's body. She is creating an ecosystem. And that ecosystem helps to create us in turn. So every animal, whether a hawk or a hummingbird or a human, develops from a single fertilized egg into a full adult body. And that process doesn't just unfold under our own steam, under instructions encoded within our own genes. It also depends on conversations and negotiations with the microbes that live within us. Here is an example of an animal that utterly depends on microbes to complete its life cycle. These little tubes are very tiny, but they can get so dense that they clog the propellers of ships and underwater surfaces. They are created by a small marine worm. That worm can only make the tubes if it becomes an adult, and it can only become an adult if it encounters the right bacteria in its environment. If for some reason all the microbes in the ocean were to suddenly disappear, this worm would be, all of these worms would die within a generation. They would never be able to complete their lives. More familiar creatures like mice or fish or humans or flies also rely on microbes throughout their entire lives to build and shape their bodies. And we know this because of rodents like this one that I am sort of holding. This is a germ-free mouse. It has been raised in this sterile plastic bubble for its entire life. 
and it is one of the few creatures in the world that has no microbiome of its own. It does not contain multitudes. It is like a silhouette that hasn't been filled in. And because of that, its body has all kinds of problems. Its bones don't develop properly, its blood vessels, its gut, its brain, all of these things are improperly formed because it lacks that connection to the microbial world. So microbes shape and sculpt our bodies, but they also help to keep those bodies safe and healthy. Um, the immune system, we traditionally think of as this militaristic force that defends us against the microbial world, that senses anything that is other or non-self, and that seeks and destroys it. But that metaphor is, is very wrong because we know that actually microbes help to build parts of the immune system. It's, they stimulate the growth of different types of immune cells. And they calibrate the immune system so that it reacts to infectious threats and keeps us healthy. But it also doesn't overreact to harmless things in the world around us, to dust and pollen and allergens in our food. Um, and it turns out that the immune system doesn't just indiscriminately kill microbes. It actually tolerates the ones that uh, live in our bodies and help us. Um, it selects for them. It decides which species get to live with us and where they get to live. So forget the militaristic analogies. I like to think of the immune system as more as a set of rangers in a national park that are trying to care for the species in the park, that decide what their population size should be, that chuck out invaders. And finally, microbes also shape our behavior. There have been many studies in mice, in some of those germ-free rodents I showed you before, showing that the microbes that live in our gut can affect the way we think, the, our resilience to stress, our susceptibility to anxiety, aspects of our mood and our personality. Whether that applies to humans or not is still being checked out, but it's entirely plausible, almost probable, because all of these aspects of our lives, all of these corners of our biology that we think of as the province of individuals, digestion, development, immunity, health, thought, all of these things happen in conversation. They happen in partnerships with the things that share our lives. And over an individual lifespan, those partnerships certainly matter, but they also matter over much longer timescales, over evolutionary time spans. Time and again, we have seen that microbes can influence the evolutionary potential of different animal groups, allowing them to take up opportunities that would be otherwise denied to them, to succeed in lifestyles that they would otherwise fail at. These are good examples. These three insects, aphid, cicada, leafhopper, are all part of a group of sap-sucking bugs that drink the fluids from plants. And they can only do that because they have bacteria living inside their cells that provide them with nutrients that are missing from that diet of plant saps, that act as living dietary supplements. Without those microbes, these insects would be totally unable to eat the food that they eat because it would be too impoverished for them. They would all die. And these groups, this group of insects is radiated to some 85,000 species, an extraordinary example of success all founded on that bacterial assistance. In the deep oceans, there are other animals that take that concept to an even greater degree. These are giant tube worms, similar to the ones I showed you before, but meters in length, and with these beautiful red gills that look like a tube of lipstick that's been pushed out all the way. They live in areas in parts of the world like hydrothermal vents, where there is no food, or at least meager amounts of it, and yet they flourish in huge numbers. And they do that because they have bacteria in their bodies that use minerals from the vent environment, break them down, and use them to make, use them to make food for the worms. Those bacteria provide this animal with all of its sustenance to the extent that it has lost its mouth, its gut, its entire digestive system. This thing doesn't need to eat because it has bacteria to provide it with all the energy it has, it needs. And most animals have kept their guts. These are good examples. These are wildebeests in the African savanna. And they, like other grazing mammals, like cows, sheep, goats, rely on microbes to break down the complex carbohydrates in the plants that they eat, substances that they lack the ability to digest on their own. The bacteria in their bodies, which are housed in their guts, which have been enlarged into these gigantic fermentation chambers, 
And those microbes provide them with something like 70% of their energy budget. Again, if you somehow destroyed all the microbes in the world, all of these herds would just die. Okay, so microbes provide animals with incredible evolutionary opportunities and they allow them to succeed at things that they would otherwise be unable to cope with. But they also accelerate the pace of animal evolution. So if an animal finds a challenge in its environment, the traditional way of dealing with that is to adapt very slowly, to accumulate small changes in its genome and to become more and more suited to its environment. But you can do that very quickly by recruiting microbes that already have those adaptations, that have already met those challenges themselves. It's a bit like having a skills gap in an organization. And rather than training your existing employees to have those skills, you just recruit people that already know how to do the job. This Japanese bean bug does that. It's a major pest in Japan, and it's controlled with insecticides. But it can become in instantly resistant to insecticides if it swallows the right bacteria in the soil, which detoxify those chemicals. This desert wood rat can do the same. It can eat the most common plant in its desert environment if it swallows microbes that can break down the heavy poisons within that plant. And these aphids can become resistant to parasitic wasps that would otherwise lay eggs in their bodies and take over. Uh, and they can do that by, by uh, taking up a beneficial microbe from their peers via sex, which makes this one of the rare cases of a desirable venereal infection. Humans can benefit from these sorts of transfers too. This is a type of seaweed that has been harvested from Japan for hundreds of years and used, is used to make nori, the stuff that wraps your sushi. Uh, nori is now cooked, but it used to be eaten raw. And because it used to be eaten raw, people who swallowed it also swallowed marine microbes that lived on the seaweed and were exceptionally good at breaking down the unique blends of nutrients and carbohydrates within. When those marine microbes entered the guts of people hundreds of years ago, they met gut microbes. And they did a thing that bacteria do all the time, but that is extraordinary to us. They swapped genes. So you and I can only pass our genetic material down from parent to child. But bacteria can do this between individuals, horizontally rather than vertically. They can sidle up to each other and exchange DNA as easily as you or I might exchange phone numbers or gifts or ideas. And that's what they did. So the marine microbe passed on genes for breaking down seaweed carbohydrates to the gut microbes. And those pass down from person to person, which is why to this date, Japanese people have gut microbiomes that are uniquely qualified to digest the carbohydrates found in sushi. Okay, so uh, microbes are cool, microbes are important. Um, I hope I've convinced you of that now. Well, one important thing I need to say is that microbes are not our friends. Even the, one that, even the ones that live within us and that have beneficial sides to them are not necessarily our allies. And there is the story about friendly bacteria and good microbes that runs counter to the idea of microbes as germs and as villains. But I think both of these ideas are equally wrong. In fact, we are just another habitat to them, just like soil or water. We are just another ecosystem in which they live. And while we do benefit from their presence, those relationships, like any in nature, can be tenuous. So the microbes that live in our gut, for example, help to break down our food, help to train our immune system, and so on. But if they cross the lining of the gut and enter our bloodstream, they can cause inflammation and sepsis. They can cause disease. For the want of a millimeter, our allies can turn into our enemies. And so there is no such thing as a good microbe or a bad microbe. In fact, these relationships take work. We need ways of containing our multitudes. We have physical barriers to keep them in specific places, to keep them from crossing the lining of the gut, for example. We have the immune system to keep them in line. We feed them with the right food so that we nourish species that are going to be useful to us, like those sugars in breast milk nourish B. infantis. And when those control measures break down, as they often do, our relationships with the microbes that live within us can turn sour. You can see some of those dynamics at work in coral reefs. So corals look like bits of rock, but they are, in fact, animals too. And they also have thriving microbiomes. 
and many of the things that kill corals are around. Um, so corals also have competitors, things called turf algae, this kind of scummy seaweed stuff that competes with them for space. So coral versus algae. A lot of the things that kill corals tip the balance of that war, giving the algae an advantage. And when they start overgrowing, they release dissolved sugars into the water, essentially junk food. And that nourishes microbes that live on the corals, allowing species that are more likely to cause disease to bloom in large numbers. So the algae effectively turn the coral's microbiome against them. And this is a very different view of disease than we're used to. It's not something like tuberculosis, which is caused by one bacterium, or plague, which is caused by one bacterium. This is a case where an entire community of microbes has shifted from a normal healthy state into one that is likely to cause disease. And there's a term for that, it's called dysbiosis. It's an imbalance in the microbial communities that live within us. This term is relevant to human health too, because a ridiculous list of uh, human disorders and diseases have been linked to changes in the microbiome, a list so long that it uh, invites parody. Now, for most of these conditions, it is still unclear if changes in the microbiome lead to disease, if it is the other way around, if it is a consequence of that, if it is both or neither. And yet those links remain. And there are experiments which suggest that there is a sort of causal effect, and those, evolve, those involve the germ-free mice that I showed you before. There have been many studies where you take a rodent that has some problem, say uh, obesity, diabetes, heart disease, colorectal cancer. You take their gut microbiomes and you put them into one of these animals, and often some of those symptoms of those conditions move across as well. So if you load that mouse with the microbiome from an obese mouse, it will start to put on weight. Now, well, that suggests that the microbes are, to an extent, grabbing the wheel rather than just going along for the ride. What that means for human health, the extent to which microbes influence all these conditions that affect us, and many of which have become more common in the last half century, that is still being worked out. Scientists are also trying to look at what's changing our microbiome, what affects the communities that live within us, and how that might affect our health. And there are many possible um, things that do that. So humans have moved away from muddy countrysides and soil and contact with animals. And lived, we live in these urban jungles that are more sterile. We have waged a very successful war against the microbial world and have taken the sound principles of hygiene perhaps to an absurd degree where we sterilize absolutely everything and have antibacterial all, all sorts of antibacterial goods. We use antibiotics. These drugs have done a tremendous amount of good for us. They have saved countless lives from infectious diseases. But they are also unsubtle weapons. They kill the bacteria that we depend upon as well as the ones that cause us harm. And we use them to an absurd degree, not just when we need them, but when we don't. And for conditions like viral diseases, for which antibiotics are completely ill-suited to. And finally, our food has changed. We are eat, we're eating much less plant foods, much lower amounts of fiber. Fiber is important because it nourishes a wide range of microbes within us. Fiber consists of a large number of complex carbohydrates, and no single species of microbe has the cutlery set it needs to eat all of them. So you eat fiber, you nourish a very diverse community. OK, so. What can we do about any of this, if anything? If we are disconnecting ourselves from the microbial world, and if those changes are, um, as some scientists suggest, leading to disease, what can we do about that? Well, theoretically, a lot. As I've shown you, microbiomes can change in positive ways very quickly. They can also change in negative ways very quickly, which means that they should be able to change in deliberate ways that we choose. Unlike, say, our genomes, which are the same throughout our entire lives and which require very complex techniques in order to manipulate, the microbiome is supposedly more flexible, more mutable. At least it is in theory. In practice, changing the world inside us is very complex. So take something like probiotics. These are products like yogurt, sachets, capsules, what have you, that supposedly contain beneficial microbes. But 
even though they are very good for certain things like infectious diarrhea, they are also medically underwhelming for a lot of other things. They have a lot of health claims that have been linked to them, and by the large, they don't meet, up, they don't meet the expectations that have been latched onto them. And that's probably because they consist of strains and species that have been chosen for historical reasons, because they're easy to manufacture and grow and package, not because they are the A-listers of the gut that are good at colonizing our bodies. Those species are then present in very small amounts. They are sometimes heavily industrialized, so they've been grown in um, industrialized cultures for a long period of time and are essentially domesticated microbes. So you swallow these products, they go in, they don't do very much, and they leave again. They certainly don't establish themselves in your body. I compare them to a breeze that blows between two open windows and that maybe rattles some objects along the way, but that doesn't have any lasting impact. Perhaps then it makes more sense to give people large communities of microbes that are well suited to life in the gut. And that is certainly the principle behind a very unorthodox and a little disturbing uh, treatment called the fecal transplant, which is exactly what it sounds like. Um, it is very difficult to find an acceptable photo of a fecal transplant. So I have prepared this very technical slide to show you how it works. So you have a sick person and you give them stool from a healthy person and then they're better. It's a bit like an ecosystem transplant. I compare it to, say, re-turfing a lawn that's been overrun with dandelions, creating this lovely, green, fresh pasture. Um, and it works, at least for one specific condition called Clostridium difficile, a very weedy and invasive bacterium that can cause severe and intractable and often fatal cases of diarrhea. Um, C. diff. Uh, there's been a trial of fecal transplantation for Clostridium difficile. Uh, in that trial, people with the condition who were given standard antibiotics, some 27% of them were cured, whereas fecal transplants cured 94% of the people who uh, took them. And time and again in many studies, this really weird and very gross procedure has worked wonders for this particular thing. Now, it has therefore been tried on a lot of other conditions that the microbiome has been implicated in, inflammatory bowel disease, irritable bowel syndrome, that sort of thing. And there the, re the results are more inconsistent and less, uh, uh, a bit less promising. And that's probably because C. diff is a very unusual situation. It really is a bit like a monoculture of weeds. Um, it may be an ecosystem that is easier to reset whereas something like the gut of someone with inflammatory bowel disease may be much more complicated. And the truth is we just don't know. We still don't really fully understand why these transplants work. Uh, and that's, that's abundantly clear when scientists try to duplicate them. So several companies have tried to create um, essentially fecal trans fake fecal transplant capsules that contain the uh, bacteria that are meant to have th that are meant to be beneficial, but without the ick factor of actual feces. Uh, and the most promising one of these pills uh, went into phase two clinical trials recently and performed really badly. They flunked out, uh, which is a big shame. But it did allow me to write probably my best headline of the last year. I think all of this goes to show that it is very hard to change the ecosystems that live within us. Um, it is not a simple case of, say, finding someone with a vitamin deficiency, giving them some, sup some supplements or like an orange and have them be better. These are complex worlds. They are the equivalent of jungles or coral reefs or grasslands. And changing them is as hard as it sounds. Um, and we are still at the very early stages of understanding the microbiome and how it affects our health. We still don't know, for example, the full list of bacteria and other microbes that live within us. We don't understand why the microbiome change varies from person to person. It certainly does. All of our microbiomes are different to each other. But um, if you take into account diet, medicines, all the various things that scientists think affect this world, we can only explain maybe about 10% of the variation across the population. The rest is a mystery. This, uh, this world is also a very dynamic one. It changes with, all our, with every one of our meals, with um, the, the rise and fall of the sun. 
uh, with our um, with the diseases and the illnesses we get and the medicines we take to make ourselves better. So we're still at this very early stage, um, and if we look at the wider world, I'm backtrack a bit. So we are at this very early stage, but in terms of Using the microbiome for medical root purposes, I think there are a couple of things that we might be able to win at more quickly than things than actually trying to change the consortium of species that live within us. And one might be to use the microbiome to, um, dis to target our drugs and our medicines more effectively. So many types of medications, from digoxin, a heart drug, to the latest blockbuster cancer therapies, to everyday things like paracetamol, work better in some people than in others, depending on the microbes that they carry, for various reasons. In some cases, the bacteria break down the drugs. In some cases, they turn the drugs into some other chemicals that have toxic side effects. But we might be able in the future to look at someone's microbiome and think, OK, you should get this drug. It will work in you. You should not get this one. It's going to make you even worse. Another thing we might be able to do is actually drug the microbiome to actually change the way the bacteria inside us work without killing them, without resorting to antibiotics. So here's one particular example. Choline and carnitine are nutrients that are found in food that we eat. And when we eat them, they get transformed into, this, into TMA and TMAO. TMAO is bad news because it slows the breakdown of cholesterol in our bodies and increases the deposition of fats in our arteries, leading to heart disease. Okay, what can we do about this? Well, we could target uh, an enzyme that we make ourselves that's encoded within our own genome that, co that, uh, that is responsible for that conversion from TMA to TMAO. Uh, there are actually drugs that can do that and that can shut down that part of the pathway, which is great news, except TMA smells of rotting fish, so it's not really something you want building up in your body. So, let's forget about that. Let's, we can try and target that bit, the conversion from choline to TMA in the first place, and that is done by bacterial enzymes rather than human ones. And there are drugs, like one called DMB, that can knock those enzymes out and therefore shut that pathway down. Now, you'll probably have heard of statins. Statins are drugs that are given to people who have high cholesterol or who have a high risk of heart disease. And statins work by targeting the human bit of us. Maybe in the future, if you go to a doctor with, uh, and you have high cholesterol and you have a high risk of heart disease, your doctor will prescribe you two drugs, a statin to control the human bit of you and something like DMB to control the bacterial bit of you. OK. As I've tried to say, all of this is still in a very early stage. Um, we are only beginning our exploration of the microbial world, even though it's been 350 years since Leeuwenhoek first saw those little organisms under his incredibly powerful lenses. If we go into the wider world, our ignorance becomes clearer and perhaps even more daunting. This picture is a tree of life. This represents everything that exists. It is a master family tree of life on Earth. Now, if I zoom in to this bit here, that's you. Uh, this tiny little twig on this little green feather are all the animals and plants, all the humans, all the things that you are familiar with. The rest of this tree is microbial. And if you look at the red dots that are everywhere, those represent groups that have never been seen and never been isolated. We only know that they exist because someone has sequenced their DNA from some bit of the world around us, from soil, from water, from our own bodies. And that purple spray on the right, that was discovered, I think, a few months ago, possibly no more than a year. That is a vast amount of bacterial diversity most of which was found in a single river in Colorado. So think about how much we still have yet to discover about the world around us. As microbiologist Jonathan Eisen writes, we basically know nothing about the total diversity of the tree of life. And I think that this diversity is worth exploring. We can't see these things. We don't know what they are. They seem insignificant to us. 
And yet the exploration of the microbial world can lead to massive and unexpected benefits for us. And that is the theme of the final story that I am going to tell you. It involves this guy, a scientist called Simeon Burt Warbach. In 1924, he and a colleague named Marshall Hertig discovered a new type of bacterium inside the cells of an insect. And they didn't know what it was, they didn't know whether it was common, what it did. Uh, it took them 12 years for Hertig to actually give the thing a name, and he named it after his friend and called it Warbachia. Warbachia lives in the cells of insects, and it lives in the cells of a lot of insects. Uh, decades after these two found it, loads of scientists who were studying bacteria in insect bodies suddenly realized that they were all studying the same thing, which was this thing. This is found in something like 40% of species of insects and other arthropods. And given that those are already the most diverse and rich and abundant organisms on the planet, this is almost certainly one of the most successful bacteria in the world. And what it does varies from host to host. Well, back here is a bit of a misandrist. It doesn't like males because it only passes down the female line from mother to daughter. So sons are a dead end to it. And it deals with that in many different ways. In this animal, the blue moon butterfly, it just kills male embryos outright. So that some populations have 100 females to every one male. Uh, in some wood lice, Warbachia transforms males into females. In some wasps, it allows the females to reproduce by cloning themselves asexually so that they have no need for males at all. In other insects, well, back here is, some people are smiling in their own, why can we get this? Um, sorry, well, back here doesn't infect people. Um, there, uh, in some cases, it is an ally, it is beneficial. Um, in this animal, the bed bug, it provides B vitamins that are missing from the animal's blood meals. This leaf has a little green bit in the corner. This is the work of a caterpillar that uses Warbachia to stop the leaf from turning yellow, creating this little green island in which the insect can continue to feed. But the thing Warbachia does that is most interesting to us involves an insect that doesn't naturally carry it, and that's this, the tiger mosquito, Aedes aegypti. This thing spreads yellow fever, dengue fever, Zika, chikungunya, all kinds of nasty tropical diseases. And for 25 years, Australian scientists have been trying to put Warbachia inside this mosquito, and they finally succeeded a while back. And they've spent so much time doing this because when the tiger mosquito carries Warbachia, it cannot spread the viruses that cause all those diseases I talked about. It transforms from a vector into a dead end for human disease. The other thing that's great about this is that Warbachia is amazing at spreading through populations. Because it changes the reproductive biology of its host, if you release infected mosquitoes into the wild, within a few generations, all the insects in the local area should carry this, mosquito, this bacterium and thus be unable to spread the diseases that cause us harm. And this approach has been tried in a few places. This is an experiment in 2011 that in a suburb in Australia that went from January to May. These grey bars represent the release of Warbachia infected mosquitoes in that suburb, and the green line shows the proportion of the wild insects that carry the bacterium that went from zero to 100. By this point, all of the insects buzzing over that suburb can't spread things like dengue, Zika, and the like. And this approach is now being tested in larger parts of the world, in places like Brazil, Colombia, Indonesia, and Vietnam, in megacities that have huge problems with these diseases. It's got many advantages to it. Uh, unlike insecticides, which need to be resprayed constantly and which are toxic, Wolbachia is not. Wolbachia doesn't infect humans, it doesn't infect other animals that might eat mosquitoes. It doesn't kill the insects, so it doesn't have any ecological consequences. We're not going to look at, uh, at uh, domino effects from a world without mosquitoes. And it uh, doesn't involve any genetic modification. Uh, so for people who have a problem with that and might be, uh, might be against using this approach, uh, well, back here is fine. It doesn't, it doesn't count. Now, 
Could Marshall and Hertig have predicted any of this? Could they have seen in 1924 when they discovered this thing that it might be a solution to some of these diseases that, infect, that affect millions of people? I highly doubt it. In fact, Wolbach died in, 19, in the 1950s, way before anyone realized how common Wolbach is, way before, he, um, he, before anyone realized that his name had been grafted onto one of the greatest pandemics in the history of life and a solution to many of our health problems. And I think the story of Wolbachia is the story of animal-associated microbes in a nutshell. For the longest time, we ignored these things. We neglected them, and then we feared them. And now I think it is time to appreciate them because they are crucial parts of the world around us. They might be important for us, not just for changing the way we live, but the way we think about ourselves and our place in the world. And I think all of that begins with basic curiosity. It was that that drove those two people to look at the, uh, to find Warbacki in the first place. It was that that drove Leuvenhoek to look at water and see the microbial world for the first time. And it's that sense of curiosity and wonder that I would like to instill in people through the book. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I think we have around five minutes for questions. Uh, so I think a lot of um, media about gene therapy and, oh, we found a new gene that does this and what X and Y and so forth. Do you think that a lot of research has been placed into genes and DNA and so forth, whereas perhaps it should have been placed into study of uh, bacteria and micro? Um, I wouldn't like to, I, I don't feel it's a zero-sum game. I mean, it, it kind of is because this funding is limited, but like we, we need to understand all of these aspects of ourselves. I, I think... Um, uh, understanding the, the human genome um, and, and using it to improve our health, um, I think will we'll pay off in the long run. Um, but the, the microbiome has been an underappreciated side of our biology, and I think it's getting its share of the limelight now. I think the comparison is that because um, when the human genome came out about uh, 12 years ago, is it now? Um, there were grandiose claims made about it. You know, understanding um, all of our DNA would give us solutions to all of these problems like schizophrenia, cancer, all, all of these things. Um, and that's been slow to turn up um, because biology is always more complicated than we think it is. And then 10 years on, there was backlash. People were saying, oh, where is all the stuff that came out of the human genome that you promised? I think the microbiome is going through exactly the same kind of hype cycle now. You know, we, I've, I've been to conferences where people talk about the microbes within us as if they were going to be this panacea for all of our health problems. And I think they might explain a lot of things, but we're still so far away from turning it into, an applica into a practical or even a predictive science. I can't look at your microbiome now and tell you like, what, like, what you have, what you're at risk of. Um, we're, just, we're just not at that stage yet. Um, I have a bit of a tangential question. Okay. Uh, so you mentioned the gut microbes in Japan doing the DNA swap mm -hmm. thing. How, how does that actually get inherited to children? Is it through breastfeeding or similar? Or? Yeah, it's a good question. So we, um, we do pass on some of our microbes to uh, our kids, um, and that's probably just through social contact. Um, Anyone who's ever watched a birth will know that it's a messy process. <laughs> and bits from all sorts of organ systems end up in all sorts of places. So yeah, you do get, you do get stuff passed along. Um, and that probably explains why transfers that happen in one individual could then cascade down the generations. Thanks. Uh, you said that um, there's now uh, evidence that um, uh, microbes are involved in the in human development. Uh, I mean, the classic story was that the sort of inside the placenta was sterile. Is, is there now much evidence to, to show that, that there are actually microbes in, inside? Where, during That's the a good question. Um, I, I more meant um, after babies are born. So as we grow up, um, they help to shape the development of you know, various organs. Um, even in a continual way, they help to, they affect, influence, say, the regeneration of the cells that line of the gut. So it's more of a continuous process that starts after birth, at least for, for us. 
Um, it certainly used to be thought of, and still largely is thought, that the womb is a sterile environment. There have been a few studies suggesting that have claimed to have found signs of bacterial DNA in the womb and in these other tissues like the amniotic sac and the umbilical cord. I'm doubtful of that. Um, I'm, I'm very, very skeptical about it. And it, I've asked a lot of scientists who work in this field, and they're also very skeptical. But, um, so the, the sterile womb paradigm still holds, I think. It's, it might be overturned in the future, but it's not yet. Any more questions? Yep. What do you use instead of shampoo? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I use shampoo. <laughs> I, um, I feel that the, the thing, the way to think about hygiene is just in terms of common sense. You know, I don't think any of us want to go back to a time when people, where sanitation wasn't a thing and we were, you know, having and drinking like sewage contaminated water. Uh, I don't, certainly think that my friends and family would be much happier if I actually showered a lot. <laughs> um, but I think we go too far with it, you know, so I... Um, I'm not one to say use like hand sanitizers all the time, and um, uh, and I think that we we take the concept of hygiene, we take the concept of cleanliness like uh, to to an absurd degree, and I think there's kind of balance, there's moderation to be had. One more question. Thank you, Brian. <laughs> So um, the conversation around overuse of antibiotics, do you address that in the book? And do you think that conversation, it seems to be gathering some momentum at the moment, uh, although I recently read that they'd found a new strain in our nose, oh, yeah. which I'm yep. not sure how I'm that was just picked up by the popular press. Or I mean, are we screwed? Is, are, we, are we overusing antibiotics? But is the conversation moving the right way to reduce that use? Yeah, I feel that it, it is. Um, maybe. Uh, so, OK. So... We are running out of antibiotics. We have, um, we have discovered no new classes in several decades, and bacteria are becoming increasingly resistant to the ones that we do have. So yeah, we're kind of screwed. Um, and we're, we're, in a, we're in really bad shape with it. Uh, I'm not going to lie, it is kind of terrifying. Um, in, in many ways, reducing the use of antibiotics uh, has two wins attached to it. It reduces the, uh, it slows down the evolution of uh, drug resistant microbes, uh, the ones that cause us harm, and it also spares the ones that live in our bodies and do good for us. So it, it's a win win thing. Um, and we should, we should be more judicious about our use of antibiotics. People get so many courses of treatment that they, have, that they really do not need. Um, and even if you go beyond the human world, um, Antibiotics in agriculture is, a, is uh, used incredibly heavily, and that should be um, cut back on too. Uh, are we? Is there hope? Well, uh, sort of. Um, there, there was that paper about a new antibiotic found in the nose. Um, we, uh, I actually wrote about that at the Atlantic. Um, the human microbiome seems like a really good potential source of new antibiotics. So the reason why they looked in the nose is that um, the mouth and the gut are places full of microbes, but they are also full of nutrients. We eat stuff all the time, so we feed the things that live there. The nose has no resources, so unless you're eating in a really strange way, <laughs> the bacteria in your nose have little to go on, and so they are incredibly competitive. They need to fight for everything that's there. Um, and antibiotics are bacterial weapons. All the things that we use to, to treat our cells are derived from molecules that bacteria use to wage war on each other. So if you look in places in the body where mi microbes see, will probably be experiencing the greatest amount of competition, we might be able to, to uh, more easily find new drugs, or at least that was the reason behind looking in the nose. Um, but these things take you know, to go from finding a new drug in a laboratory study to actually having a marketable antibiotic takes a lot of work. And one of the problems at the moment is that there's basically no incentive for doing that. Um, that like, if you're a pharmaceutical company, your business model is to find a new drug, release it into the, into the market, have it be a co-total blockbuster that dominates the market for a few years before your patent runs out. So you make as much money as possible. Problem with antibiotics is that 
what everyone tells you to do with antibiotics is to hold back on them until you really need them. So a business model where you're producing a new drug and then people tell you not to use it for a very long time is a crap one, which is why there's been so much disinvestment here. So I think it's not just a case of finding new drugs or like slowing down our use of the current ones. We also need to change the economics of it. And there have been suggestions of creating these like, um, uh, like entry reward schemes where you pay, you pay companies for the process of research and development. Um, and you do that through like public funds that will probably, be need, uh, probably need to be gathered through large international pots. Thank you very much. We are running out of time, so thank you again, Ed Young. Thanks, folks.